So this lecture is part of an online course on the theory of numbers and will be about Euler's theorem. So um, we'll start by giving you a bit of background. Euler's theorem is a generalization of Fermat's theorem. And we remember from last lecture well, that Fermat's theorem has two forms. You can either say a to the p is congruent to a mod p, where p is prime, or we can say a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p whenever p is prime and a is not divisible by p. And sometimes the first form is a little bit more convenient and sometimes the second form is a little bit more convenient. So Euler and probably Fermat proved the first form by using the binomial theorem as we saw earlier. Um, and what Euler did was he found a second proof that's more convenient for the second form of this. Um, and Euler also noticed that his proof then gave a generalization to um, when, when you can replace p by something that isn't prime. And his generalization is the following. It says a to the phi of m is congruent to 1 modulo m. This is for any m. And we again need a should be co-prime to m. Here, this is Euler's totient function. And you remember it's the number of integers b with 1 less than or equal to b less than or equal to m that are co-prime to m. And of course, if p is prime, then phi of p is equal to p minus 1. So uh, in the special case when m is prime, this just gives us the second form of Fermat's theorem. Um, so Euler proved this theorem using group theory. Well, um, sort of. Uh, he didn't actually use group theory because group theory hadn't been invented at the time and Euler sort of <coughs> invented a fair amount of group theory in order to prove this theorem. Um, again, we're going to use the language of group theory, although Euler himself would have phrased it differently. So the, the key point is the non-zero element, elements mod p, which are 1, 2, up to p minus 1, form a group under multiplication. Well, I'd better just remind you what a group is. So saying they form a group just means it has these four conditions. First of all, they're closed under multiplication. And by multiplication, we mean, of course, multiplication modulo p. Um, secondly, there's an identity. This means an element 1 such that 1 times a equals a times 1 equals a. That's obvious because 1 is an identity. Um, thirdly, it has to be associative. It says that a times b times c equals a times b times c, which is again is completely obvious. So these three conditions are more or less obvious. The fourth condition is slightly more subtle. It says that um, all elements have inverses. What this means is there's an element a to the minus 1 such that a times a to the minus 1 equals a to the minus 1 a equals 1. Um, and the element a to the minus 1, you know, if, if I take 2 to the minus 1, I don't mean the element a half. I mean there has to be an element in this group which um, when you multiply it by a gives you 1. So why are there inverses? Well, that follows, well, there are several ways of doing it. Um, I'm going to do a rather computational method using um, Euler's algorithm. Um, what you do is you look at the equation ax plus bm equals 1. Um, here we're taking a and b and m and x to be integers, and am is 1, by assumption, um, so it has a, uh, a solution. Sorry, that should be a, a y. So it has a solution. Um, and um, this just means that ax is congruent to 1 
modulo m. So in other words, the element x satisfying this is an inverse of the element A. So, so Euclid's algorithm shows that all elements have inverses. And, and this is why we need to assume that, um, that the element A is co-prime to M, because if you look at elements that aren't co-prime to M, you can obviously see they, 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 they don't actually have inverses. Um, now, in order to see why this um, can be used to prove Euclid's so Euler's theorem, let's look at an example. Let, let's just take p equals 13. And I'm going to take the element a to be th 3. And I want to show that a to the 12 is equal to 1. And I want to do it in such a way that this generalizes to, to all primes and to all, all numbers co-prime to, to it. So let's write out the elements mod 13 except for 0. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So um, uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick out the powers of a. So we have a to the 0, a to the 1, a to the 2 is 9, and a to the 3 is 27, which gets us back to 1. So green circle are just powers of a. So that's 1 a, a squared, a cubed equals 1, and so on. So they, they just go around in a cycle. Um, and you notice the powers of a form a group. They're closed under... Um, multiplication and they also are inverses because the inverse of a to the n is a to the minus n and so on. Um, I guess we could also include a to the minus 1 if you wanted. Um, so um, uh, next we're going to multiply all these by 2. So if I, if I multiply all these elements by 2 I get 2 then I get 3 times 2 which is 6 and then I get 9 times 2 which is 18 which is 5. So blue is 2 times, the things of the form 2 times a to the n. Um, and then I can do the same with 4. So I'm going to take 4 times a to the n, so I get um, 4 times 1, 4 times 3 is 12, and 4 times 9 is um, 36, which is 10. And then I, uh, it's pretty obvious what I'm going to do now, so, so, so this is going to be 4 times a to the n. And now the leftover ones are going to be, say, 7 times a to the n. Um, and these four colours correspond to what are called cosets of this group. Let's call this group H. And then um, the cosets of H are going to be where you take the group H and multiply all its elements by some, by some number. And now we notice some properties of cosets. First of all, every element is in some coset. Um, secondly, any two cosets are disjoint. And that's because any coset, um, so, 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 so if a coset contains an element B, the coset is just consist of all elements of the form b times um, a to the n for various values of n. So, so a coset is determined by um, any element in it. So any two cosets are either the same or, or they must be disjoint. And the third key point is any two cosets have the same number of elements. And you can see this very easily because if you've got a coset consisting of the powers of A, say, and you've got a coset consisting of B times the powers of A, then we can easily define a map between these. So this is just multiplication by B, and then we can define a map in the other way, which is multiplication by B to the minus 1. So we've got two maps between these two cosets within 
that, 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 that are inverses of each other. So we've got a bijection between them and they have the same number of elements. You notice that this um, depends on the fact that elements of the group of inverses, um, and in fact, uh, the, the part two, we were also implicitly using the existence of inverses. So now we can say the following. Um, since all cosets have the same size, we see that the, the, um, um, the order of the group from 1 to up to 12 is equal to the order of H times the number of cosets. So this here is the order of the group we started with. And H is actually a subgroup of the group which means a group contained in another group with the same multiplication, rather obviously. Um, so um, now if we want the order of A, uh, we can see that this is just the order of H. So, so the, the order of H is the number of elements, and the order of A is the smallest um, E with a to the e equals 1. And you can see this is obvious because h is just the elements 1, a, a squared up to a to the e minus 1. Um, so what this shows is that the order of a is the order of h, and this shows that the order of h divides the order of um, the original group g. Let's call the original group g. I think I forgot to name it, but it's in this case it's going to be the numbers from 1 to 12. And since the order of H is the order of A, this implies that the order of A divides the order of G. So A to the order of G is equal to 1. And now we notice that the order of G is just phi of 13. In this case, that's pretty much the definition of phi of 13. It's, it's, the, um, it's the number of numbers from 1 to 12 that are co-primed to 13. Um, and now you see the same thing works for any integer n. And what we do is we take a group G to be the um, integers b with um, 1 less than or equal to b less than or equal to m, such that b m equals 1. And the key point is that g forms a group of order phi of m. And again, it's obviously closed under multiplication, and it's obviously associative. And the key point is to prove the existence of inverses. And the existence of inverses follows in much the same way as before. If a is in, in the group g, then we solve ax plus my equals 1, and then x is an inverse of a. And to do this, we, we need to assume that a and m are co-prime. Um, so just as before, um, if a m equals 1, we put h equal the powers of a, and as before, we find the order of h divides the order of g, which is equal to phi of m. And just as before, this shows that a to the um, order of g is equal to 1. Um, so a to the phi of m equals 1. Um, incidentally, this works for any group whatsoever. And what we've shown is the order of a subgroup H of a group always divides the order of G as long as both are finite. This, this is Lagrange's theorem. And a special case of Lagrange's theorem is the order of any element of a group divides the order of a group because you can take H to be the powers of that element. Um, 
So, um, Euler's theorem is looks like a very nice generalization of Fermat's last theorem, but I have to uh, uh, sort of confess here that Euler's theorem is actually not very good. It, it's kind of weak. Um, and let me give an example. Suppose we take m equal 8. Then we know 5 of 8 is equal to 4. So Euler's theorem tells us that a to the power of 4 is congruent to 1 mod 8 if a is co-prime to 8. However, this is a rather bad theorem because a can be 1, 3, 5 or 7. And if you look at a squared, it's congruent to 1, 1, 1 or 1 mod 8. So in fact, a squared is congruent to 1 modulo 8, which is a, a slightly stronger than Euler's theorem. In fact, we, we will see later on how to find the smallest possible exponent you can put up there. And it's, it's certainly a divisor of phi of m, but it's quite often strictly smaller than phi of m. Um, as, a, as another example, um, to show that 8 just wasn't a... Uh, show that this is actually quite common, let's just take m to be 35. And then we know that a to the 6 is congruent to 1 modulo 7 by Fermat. And we know that a to the 4 is congruent to 1 modulo 5, again by Fermat. And this means that a to the 12 is congruent to 1 modulo 5 and also congruent to 1 modulo 7. So a to the 12 is congruent to 1 modulo 35. And Euler's theorem says that a to the 24 is congruent to 1 modulo 35 because phi of 35 is just 24. And you see there's nothing special about 7 and 5. The same argument works for any two different odd primes. So, so, so th th there, there are very many cases when Euler's theorem isn't the best possible. Um, so as an application of Euler's theorem, let's... Um, solve the famous recreational mathematics problem. Let's find the last digit of 7 to the 7 to the 7 to the 7. In other words, we want to work out what is this modulo 10. Um, well, obviously it's quite hopeless to um, expand this out explicitly. It would be ludicrously large. Um, but working out mod 10, it's much easier. So 7 to the n mod 10 depends on n modulo phi of 10, which is 4 by Euler's theorem. So we want to know what is 7 to the 7 to the 7 modulo 4. Well, this depends on 7 to the 7 modulo phi of 4, which is equal to 2. So here, um, just to be clear, um, when we're writing down 7 to the power of 7, the 7 to the power of 7 are these two 7s, not these two, if you see what I mean. And similarly, this n here is going to be this pile, pile of three 7s. Um, well, obviously, 7 to the 7 is congruent to 1 modulo 2, and from this we can work out 7 to the 7 to the 7 is congruent to 7 to the 1, which is congruent to 3 mod 4. And then we work out 7 to the 7 to the 7 to the 7 is congruent to 7 to the 3, um, which is congruent to 3 modulo 10. So the last digit of this number is, 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 is just a 3. Um, uh, the, the final application I want to give of Euler's theorem is really only an application of Fermat's theorem, but I kind of forgot to put this in the in the lecture on Fermat's theorem, so I'm pretending it's a special case of Euler's theorem. What we're going to do is to show there are infinitely many primes with last digit equal to 1. In other words, p is congruent to 1 modulo 10. Um, and informally, it's, it's sort of obvious that this is almost certainly going to be true because 
um, the last digit of a prime is one, three, seven, or nine, and the primes are almost certainly going to be evenly distributed between these four last digits. And as there are an infinite number of primes, you expect just by chance they're going to be infinitely many with last digit one. So this theorem is not surprising. On the other hand, these informal probabilistic arguments, while easy, are, are they, 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 they don't, they're not worth all that much in number theory. They don't explain what's going on and they aren't proofs. And incidentally, it's not quite true to say that primes are evenly distributed between having last digit one, three, seven, or nine, because there's actually a slight bias towards having last digit three or seven. So you've got to be very wary of saying that primes are evenly distributed because they sometimes aren't. Um, anyway, in order to understand why this is true, let's give an actual proof of it. Um, well, we may as well say that P is congruent to 1 modulo 5, because if it's 1 modulo 5, then it's going to be 1 modulo 10. Um, and what we're going to do is suppose P divides x to the 5 minus 1 over x minus 1. So there's this magic polynomial 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the 4. And I seem to pull this wretched polynomial out of midair for no reason. You may well ask where it comes from. Well, it's actually something called the cyclotomic polynomial. And the roots are the primitive fifth roots of 1. So that's where this weird looking polynomial comes from, really. Well, anyway, suppose that P divides the, um, this for some integer x. Then this implies x to the 5 is congruent to 1 modulo P. So x has order 1 or 5, because these 1 and 5 are the divisors of 5. Um, if x is order 1, this implies that x um, is equivalent to 1 mod 5. So 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the 4 is equivalent to 5 mod 5. And sorry, 5 mod, uh, that should be a p there. So if x is, and that should be a p there. Sorry, I just miswrote that. Um, so um, if x, so, so, so if this is 5 mod p, this is also divisible by p, so p equals 5. So that's one possibility. And now if x is order 5, then as we saw earlier, 5 divides p minus 1, so p is congruent to 1 mod 5. So x equals 5 or um, p, sorry, so p equals 5 or p is congruent to 1 modulo 5. Um, so this gives us a way of finding primes that are 1 modulo 5. All you do is you um, pick a factor of 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the 4. So suppose p1 up to pk are primes. And suppose they're the primes that we found that are congruent to 1 mod 5, although they don't have to be. And now we do what we do is we pick p, which is a factor of... 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the 4. And now we pick x to be 5, p1, p2, up to pk. And now we notice that this choice of x, it forces p not equal to 5 or p1 up to pk. So p is a new prime with p congruent to 1 modulo 5. So if we find any collection of primes that are 1 modulo 5, we can find another prime not in that set. And you notice this is just like Euler's proof that there are infinitely many primes, except we're, we're using this rather funny cyclotomic polynomial.
So that shows there are infinitely many primes that are 1 modulo 5. Um, the same works for any prime. Um, any prime p, there are infinitely many primes um, congruent to 1 modulo p. And you can do this in the same way, except you use x to the p minus 1 over x minus 1, which is 1 plus x plus and so on, all the way up to x to the p minus 1, which is also a cyclotomic polynomial. It seems to be much more difficult to prove there are infinitely many primes congruent to, say, 2 modulo p. Um, that was proved by Dirichlet, but uses um, um, harder techniques. Um, I'll just finish by... Um, giving an exercise, prove there are infinitely many primes congruent to 1 modulo 8. And 8 is not a prime, so this doesn't quite work. And it's a hint is we use the polynomial x to the 4 plus 1, which you may notice its roots are the primitive 8th roots of unity over the complex numbers. OK, so next lecture, we'll be looking at the Chinese remainder theorem and studying why um, Euler's theorem doesn't really work. It, it isn't best possible in general for non-prime numbers and what the best possible version is.